Our speaker this morning, Dr. Robert Moore Jumanville, uh, is professor of Christian spirituality in the Department of Theology. I have often passed Robert Moore Jumanville on the Falling Waters Trail while riding my bike while he is jogging along the trail. And it wasn't until about a year ago that I realized he's actually working on a book uh, that he recently published called Jogging with Chesterton, uh, jogging uh, with the thoughts and writings and ideas and praying through the work of G.K. Chesterton. Robert completed his Master's of Divinity from Princeton and his Ph.D. from the University of Iowa. He is pastor of the Pope United Methodist Church, and we are glad to have him this morning giving our first focus keynote lecture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Moore Jumanville. Thanks, Robbie, for that kind introduction. If I asked you to hold your hand up in the configuration of a backward C, it could mean several things. It could be a gang sign. I don't think it is. It could represent a challenge to focus this week during focus. It could signify that ancient hero, Pac-Man. But if you squared the edges, it would resemble the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the bait, as in Aleph bait. Bait also uh, is a preposition, in, and it happens to be the first word in the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, as in in the beginning or when God created. And since Hebrew reads from right to left, the opening of the bait points in the direction in which scripture flows. Now, you might think that that's unimportant, but not so with Rabbi Akiva ben Joseph, a major contributor to the Mishnah who died in 137 AD. Rabbi Akiva would say, what? You think that any word of God can be without this significance? Are you out of your mind? Let me tell you what it means. Our little friend here, the bait, he says to us, our God, the God of Israel, is hidden, and we must learn to seek him. So where do you think that we should seek him? Back in history? No, he is the God of the living. How about on the earth or under the earth? God forbid. How about up in heaven? You want to relegate him even up there? I don't think you've got a ladder that big to find him. That's just a bunch of Babel, right? <laughs> where is God? In the Torah, here are the words of life in the path of wisdom. So the world asks us, where is your God? And Rabbi Akiva would respond, Lord, I seek your face. Hide not your face from me. Only give me eyes to see. Akiva would say, God is concealed in this book, but we must learn to seek him. Seek him here in the Holy Scriptures, but only so that you can better recognize him in the world around you, so that you can learn to discover God's face in the face of your neighbor, God's shape in the fold of the landscape around you, God's goodness in a simple meal or in a cup of coffee. Akiva was no biblical literalist. He wouldn't want to narrow Scripture down as an end in itself. He realizes that Scripture is a means to an end. Even as medicine is a means to health, Scripture is a means to salvation, to communion with God. I think those who've crafted the St. John's Bible would agree with Rabbi Akiva. This illuminated text of Scripture, the St. John's Bible, serves as a means to an end, a means of grace inviting us to seek God. Now, two assumptions quickly become evident. First, God is hidden. Second, we must learn to seek Him uh, through Scripture, through prayer, and through praying the Scripture. These first two sets of slides, we see here John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and um, uh, John the Baptist on the right. Uh, and next slide, please, Nathaniel. These first uh, two sets of illuminations indicate the divine 
as both luminous and concealed. So on the left, the transfiguration. On the right, the walk to Emmaus. So straight away, a question surfaces. Why is God hidden? In the first place, it's not so much that God hides, but that we in our human limitations can't perceive God even at times uh, when he is present. You know the hymn, holy, holy, holy. Though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. That's our human condition. We're like those souls in Plato's parable of the cave, chained to a wall, able only to see the shadows on the wall and not the deeper reality around us that's infused with spirit. Theophilus of Antioch compared our condition to the seeds in a pomegranate rind that because they're enclosed in the rind cannot see objects outside themselves. Just so, we are enclosed within all creation in the hand of God. Quote, it is he whom you breathe and you do not know it. For your eye is blind, your heart is hardened, but if you wish, you can be cured. Entrust yourself to the doctor and he will open the eyes of your soul and your heart. Think of the St. John's Bible then as medicine, as an instrument, a salve used by the doctor to cure spiritual vision. But second, beyond our human limitations, it seems also that God chooses to remain hidden at times behind this cloud of unknowing. Why? Perhaps because we human beings are inveterate idolaters? God remains disguised within the world because he knows we tend to turn him into something small and petty and self-serving. My God to serve my purposes. Church Father Gregory of Nyssa argued, every concept formed by the intellect, every concept formed by the intellect, in an attempt to comprehend and circumscribe the divine nature, can only succeed in fashioning an idol, not in making God known. How quickly we turn God into something manageable or worse. In C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters, Uncle Screwtape instructs his nephew, the junior tempter Wormwood, to encourage human beings to affirm ownership and then to extend that ownership to God. In a voice uh, very much like Peter Lorre, we teach them not to notice the different senses of the possessive pronoun. The finely graded differences that run from my boots through my dog, my servant, my wife, my father, my master, my country to my God. <laughs> they can be taught to reduce all these senses to that of my boots, the my of ownership. Even in the nursery, a child can be taught to mean by my teddy bear, not the old imagined recipient of affection, but the bear I can pull to pieces if I like. <laughs> and at the other end of the scale, we have taught men to say, my God, in a sense, not really very different from my boots, <laughs> meaning the God on whom I have a claim, <laughs> whom I exploit from the pulpit. <laughs> That's why Lewis wrote, the prayer preceding all prayers is, may it be the real I who speaks, may it be the real thou that I speak to. Because so often, even in our sincerest prayers, we turn God into something less than God. And yet there's another question that emerges related to God's hiddenness, a rather pesky one that we might rather avoid. Um, the question is, let's assume God is hidden and that to connect with him, we need to learn to seek him. Why don't we? Why are we so half-hearted? Pascal's Pensee 149 might help elucidate what I mean. Let me paraphrase the end of it. God could overcome the doubts of the most hardened skeptic by showing up, by revealing himself in the way he will appear at the last day. Quote, with such thunder and lightning and such convulsions of nature that the dead will rise up and the blindest will see him. 
However, my paraphrase, that would be like God handing out A's to students who never did their reading and always slept through class. So on the one hand, it was not fitting for God to show up in such a way that those who don't deserve his mercy would be convinced beyond a doubt, almost against their will. And yet, on the other hand, it wasn't fitting for God to hide himself so thoroughly that those who earnestly sought him couldn't find him if they tried. Quote, thus wishing to appear openly to those who seek him with all their heart, he has qualified our knowledge of him by giving signs which can be seen by those who seek him and not by those who do not. It seems we should learn to seek the signs. But let me ask again, why don't we seek God? I think at this point, it's best to be honest and simply admit that not everyone is interested in the question of God's presence or absence. Uh, last fall, Jim Triggs, executive director of the Heritage Program, came to Spring Arbor to speak to us about the wonders of the St. John's Bible. Uh, and, and he was uh, speaking in RCF, you know, that professors bribe students through offers of extra credit to come to some of these events. And so, you know, the, the commitment level sort of um, varies. But let me show you a, a slide now um, from Trigg's uh, lecture. If you could put up the next slide. Um, so here uh, you see Jim Triggs in the background and he has the illumination from Genesis chapter 1 with these seven panels, marvelous, one for each day of creation. And then you see, I think you can tell what she's got on her computer, Pinterest. Go ahead and put away your cell phones now. Uh, couldn't we say that atheism is not as great a threat today to Christendom as is indifference? Don't we also have to admit that this candid photo clearly reveals the busy and distracted state of our souls? This is who we are, frantic and too terrified to slow down. Or to put it in lyrical form, there's no hiding for me, I'm forced to deal with what I feel, there is no distraction to mask what is real. I could build a steering wheel, I have these thoughts so often I ought to replace the slot with what I once bought. Because someone stole my car radio and now I just sit in silence. Think of that, no hiding for me. I'm forced to deal with what I feel. No distraction, the mask what is real. Oh, how our media fixations save us from unwanted self-examination. Our modern fear of silence lurks deep in the heart of the human condition. On the one hand, human beings are finite, fragile, fallible, dependent. On the other hand, God is wild, inscrutable, sovereign. And when you put those two together, you've got a recipe for anxiety. We call out, yet often God remains hidden. And we shudder at the prospect of being alone, perhaps orphaned by the universe. It is true, God does give us a name by, by which to address him. The sacred name. But this holy name of God cryptically reads, I am who I am. I'll give you my name so you can call upon me in worship, but don't take it in vain. Don't yank my chain. We all complain that we're too busy, that we've got too much going on in our lives, but in fact, we've got way too much time on our hands, so much so that we're trying to numb ourselves through entertainment and distraction and hurry. We want distraction precisely so we don't have to face the dire condition of what it means to be human. Vulnerable, afraid, alone, driven, empty, anxious. Peter Kreft says, we don't, uh, Peter Kreft says, we want to complexify our lives. We don't have to. We want to. We want to be harried and hassled and busy. Unconsciously, we want the very thing we complain about for if we had more time, we would look at ourselves and listen to our hearts and see the great gaping hole in our hearts and be terrified because that hole is so big that nothing but God can fill it. As we've begun the Lenten season, ponder for a minute with me how easily the devil manipulates human anxiety. Think, for instance, of the primal sin in the Garden of Eden. God's not there at the time. He's left Adam and Eve 
alone in the garden. He only arrives later to find Adam and Eve covering themselves, you know, in, in shame. Adam, where are you? God asks. And, and so as the curtain opens on that initial scene, imagine Eve by herself, you know, maybe feeling isolated, a little desolate. Where is everyone? Up slinks the serpent with malice aforethought. Where is this, this God of yours? Maybe he's abandoned you. Why has he left you alone? You shouldn't trust him. He's holding back on you. You, you, you eat this fruit right now and you will be like a god. You'll be strong like him. You won't need to worry anymore about being afraid. No more fear about privation or discomfort or loneliness or insecurity or abandonment. Here, quickly reach for this enchanted elixir. Did you ever consider what it would have been like if Eve had insisted that she and the serpent wait for God to come back before they decided about the fruit? So before Adam ever shows up, let's imagine that the serpent has Eve cornered, alone. Only this time, Eve takes a more contemplative approach. Not letting the serpent, who's dressed at this point in sheep's clothing, push her into buying anything in a hurry. You should eat this fruit. God told us not to. Did he say, don't eat any of it? No, just from this tree. Why do you think not this one? I don't know. Maybe he's planning on taking it out to get it cleaned. <laughs> I think he wants it all for himself. You know, you look awfully stressed. <laughs> Doesn't that fruit look good though? Yes, but there are lots of trees. I know, let's have a tour. I'll show you. There's some tangy trees over here and this most delicious sweet fruit over here. But this fruit, you have to eat this fruit. It's going to make you wise. I mean, like, like really, <laughs> like really, really, really smart. <laughs> Maybe you think too much. I do have a lot of grand ideas, <laughs> like the Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> are you getting enough sleep? Your eyes are all bloodshot. Now, I know. Let's wait for Adam to come back, and we'll ask him to help us decide. No, we cannot wait. That's the one thing we can't do. I don't know if snakes can stomp their feet or not. <laughs> we can't wait. I know. We could sing some hymns while we're waiting. Oh, I hate hymns. I'm going to invent the worship chorus. <laughs> Don't you think you should eat this fruit before it's too late? You're going to miss out on your one great chance to be like God. Funny thing is, you know, we already are like him, you know. In his image and all. Hurry. Time is wasting. Eat it now. Calm down, Mr. Slide. Why do you have to be in such a hurry? I know, let's wait for God to come back and we'll ask him what he wants to do with this fruit. Say, have you ever played euchre? <laughs> At the core of all temptation swirls this spirit of impatience, a spirit that grows agitated with silence or when faced with too much emptiness or solitude. This evil spirit whispers, this is not enough. It will never do. You are abandoned and rejected. So, so quick now, hurry before it's too late. Don't wait. It'll be gone. Taste it. Buy it now. Grab the kiss. YOLO. <laughs> Cave diem. In contrast, the St. John's Bible encourages us to slow down. Take a deep breath. If you've had the opportunity of handling it, you know you, you can't simply rush through the pages. It doesn't come with a clicker, right? I've, I've had the, the privilege of taking it home twice uh, for the weekend to uh, use at our church. And I can tell you just the size and weight of the Gospels and Acts volume alone is considerable. Uh, and when, you, when you, you put the book down on the couch and it looks up at you, it's not saying, all right, now hurry up, mate, let's go, quick, 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 let's go, pip, pip, let's go, read me, read me, right now, let's have at it. Um, it says something like, Slow down, you take too fast. You gotta make the morning last. Feeling groovy. Anyway, so, okay. <laughs> the texture and the weight, even, you know, it's saying slowly. You know, like a, a really good slow back rub. Like really good slow flecks of snow flakes swirling. This is a sensory experience. It's tactile, you know. The illuminations themselves ask to be 
red like a, a text. You know, the, the, the colors and the combinations of the colors say, let's linger here. And so the St. John's Bible is less like a Netflix adventure slash crime slash thriller killer slash 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 series and more like a good slow dance partner. In an interview, Alan Reed, who was a member of the Committee on Illuminations and Texts, said of the St. John's Bible, it's so against everything the culture is about right now. Easy consumerism, use and toss. And then he adds, we've had some complaints from people that this is hard to read. And we say, no, it's not hard to read. It just slows you down, which is what you want people to do when they're meditating on these images and on these words. End quote. It's only when we slow down that we're able to touch the finitude of our humanity and declare in our vulnerability that this is enough. Beauty cannot be rushed. In fact, nothing that is fully human can be rushed. Neither birth, nor growth, nor learning, nor beauty, nor virtue, nor death. And our human search for God cannot be rushed. Perhaps reading and meditating on a book like the St. John's Bible indicates an ethical dimension. This kind of reading slows us down and slowing down is a necessary ingredient for choosing well and choosing wisely. And if that's true, no wonder advertisers prefer image over word. Oh, we could come up with exceptions of um, inspiration that seems to come in a flash like Handel's Messiah. But it's not humanly wise to go rushing out looking for something more, something better for some greener grass over the far fence. I'm reminded of this cartoon where Christian Martians have landed and um, they're, they're, they've gotten out of their spaceship and they're looking around with their big goggle eyes and I imagine that somehow they've been sent on a mission from their church board up in Mars and the, the caption reads, in search of greener pastors. Right. <laughs> a dissatisfied culture rushes around looking everywhere for answers in the wrong places, leaving home to find something new, something better. But beauty takes time. The St. John's Bible took 15 years. And beauty implies, I think, a, a certain lingering, a certain staying put, being rooted. There's a story from the annals of uh, Spring Arbor University history, which has become sort of legendary, the power outage of 05. It was February 2005, and an uh, ice storm shut down the campus. Um, all the lights went out, right? Um, and, and so classes were temporarily canceled. But because no, no one knew when they'd resume, everybody stayed around. If you had announced that classes were going to be canceled ahead of time for the day, People would have left for Ann Arbor if the roads were clear or Lansing to, to, you know, have fun. Or if they lived close by, they would have gone home. But since nobody knew, people kind of hung out. And the, the annual war between uh, Beta and Ormston, the snow war broke out. And I think a dorm window was busted. Huzzah! And, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the people obviously sledded on Mount Beebe. But they crowded into what was the old cougar den for warmth and into uh, dorm lounges. And, and years later, we would hear from students who were there who would say wistfully, you know, we didn't have anything to do. Cell phone technology wasn't as much back then. And so we just hung out and we talked as if it mattered. In Chesterton's novel, Man Alive, one of the characters exclaims with passion, if we are snowed up in this room, we'd be the better for reading scores of books and that bookcase we don't even know are there. We'd have talks with each other, good, terrible talks, that we shall go to the grave without guessing. When we do slow down, one of the things we discover is that human beings are beautiful creatures if we take the time to get to know them. Because beauty cannot be rushed. Of course we want more. We want greener grass. We want greener groceries. We want, we want greener technology. We want greener bodies. We want to stay saplings forever because somehow this is not enough. In his novel, Hannah Coulter, Wendell Berry offers a, a beautiful example of receiving life as enough, which incidentally serves to underscore uh, how dissatisfied most of us are most of the time. In a crucial line in the book, Hannah exclaims, members of Port William are not trying to get someplace. They think they are someplace. 
Looking for a better place, Hannah muses, means you'll likely end up in a worse one. You don't ask to be given a different life with a different man. You accept the one you've got and you make it good. Early in the book, Hannah sets up this refrain as she reflects on the happiness of her young life with her grandmam. We had everything but money. It was a good enough life too. You see, if we're afraid that we don't have enough, we're going to end up speeding up. We're going to end up rushing things. Because somehow we think slowness is, is some sort of evidence of moral deficiency, torpitude. You know, like when the person uh, in the car in front of you has the audacity to go the speed limit. Morons, you know. The smart person, the, or, the urbane, uh, sophisticated person knows how to get it done fast. Uh, I love this New Yorker cartoon. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Nathaniel. I don't know if you can see that. There's sometimes quicker isn't better. In New York, we wouldn't call this quick. Yeah. Don't Americans always want to make a magic quick formula uh, to, to somehow get it done faster as though life were a race? When I was growing up, the so-called experts discovered um, something they, they, they told nursing mothers was better than their own milk formula, right? So nursing mo uh, mo young mothers were, were feeding their children formula instead of their own milk. And we know how that turned out. We got the baby boomers, you know, the most dissatisfied generation in American history. Uh, unfortunately, I was, I was at the end, uh, tail end of the baby boomers. So instead of getting fed formula, uh, I was fed tang. <laughs> I mean, do we even know what tang is? It's like, it's like orange powdered chemicals that are like radioactive, you know? <laughs> so the drink of astronauts, yeah, radioactive astronauts. I mean, the good thing about Tang though is like if, you, if you're camping at night, you don't even need a headlamp, you just like glow, you know? <laughs> Leave your headlamp at home. So we might call this greener, faster grass temptation the hungry ghost because it's the kind of gnawing spirit that can never be satisfied. You know, like, um, like it was put by that uh, British American theologian Mick Jagger. I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> we're always ravenous, always stuffing more in, but we're always empty. It's never enough. And of course, Jesus faced this sort of temptation in the wilderness. Another good Lenten scripture. Satan or the devil, depending on which gospel you're reading, accosts Jesus in the wilderness, offering three temptations. Turn these stones to bread, dive off the temple, take for yourself all the, the wealth and power of the kingdoms of the world. And the psychology of the, tempt, uh, of the tempter runs pretty much as follows. And remember, Jesus is fully human, and he's alone in the desert. First, turn these stones to bread. You know... You're fragile, you're vulnerable, you're dependent. You're in the wilderness, by the way. Secure for yourself goods you need. You never again have to subject yourself to privation or discomfort. Two, dive off the temple and let the angels catch you. Jesus, right now, you're in the wilderness, you're alone. When you go back home, you're, you're alienated from other people anyway. When you dive off the temple and the angels catch you, you are never going to feel rejected again. You are, uh, you're going to have this uh, sense of well-being with your peers. You'll never feel abandoned. And then three, take all the kingdoms of the world. Life is unpredictable. It's precarious. It's dangerous. So here, do something. Take power into your own hands. Be your own God. Now, all of these temptations boil down into the single temptation to, to mistrust God, I think. Jesus, God has abandoned you. You're going to die out here. Your life is going to end up being one big waste, the big nothing. Don't just sit here passively. Hurry up and do something. The wilderness is not enough. It's not enough comfort, not enough love, not enough security. I don't think your God is enough. Jesus, I don't think you're enough. One senses the devil's impatience. Interestingly, Jesus responds to the devil the same way each time by referring to scripture. You know where he, he quotes each time? From the book of Deuteronomy chapters 8 to 10. 
Chapters which indicate for us God's faithfulness to Israel. That God is enough for Israel in the wilderness. Remember also that this uh, book of Deuteronomy is the last book of the Torah. And this is what it means to be Israel. The Torah ends in Deuteronomy, which ends in the wilderness, which means this is who we are. We wait for God, and we declare that God is enough even in the wilderness. Isn't it obvious that the opposite of rushing ourselves into distraction is slowing down? God says, wait. God says, be still so that you can know that I am God. Like that famous uh, infamous South American hunting tribe that would, would travel and then stop on its trek seemingly without reason. And when asked why, the chief said, we're letting our souls catch up with us. Spiritual formation is a slow process. Israel's learning in the wilderness was slow, 40 years slow, probably about three miles an hour. But we do have to admit that slowing down makes us uncomfortable. What if I come into the wilderness and I find only a threatening emptiness and void there? What if I find that I'm abandoned in the wilderness, lost in the cosmos? A professor friend of mine recently shared a metaphor that makes a lot of sense to me. He said that lately his life reminds him of the Greek islands. From one island you can see the next, from that next island you can see another, and so on. And similarly, he said, his life has moved from one known achievement to the other. Went to college, graduated, went to seminary, got married, graduated from seminary, went on for the PhD, finished that, got the first job, published a dissertation, had some kids, got a house, you know, achieved tenure. And then he said, and now I don't see what comes next. One day, you're on an island looking out and you don't see anything only open sea. For all of us, the image of the open sea here represents the spiritual journey inward. And it's a journey without clear boundaries, which can be a little bit disconcerting. When we go inward, we begin to get anxious because we don't want to face ourselves. Like the friend of mine who said he was, he was thinking of leaving his family and traveling in Russia, but then he realized he'd have to take himself with him. We're all Jacob here, stopped at the brook, alone, without our stuff. And then we're forced to wrestle with ourselves and our inner demons. And this inner spiritual journey just keeps on going deeper and deeper into the open sea of God. And it slows down and it presents to us this threatening void at times. My spiritual director put it this way. If your expectation fixes your attention on the promised land, some imagined high point that you want to achieve in your life out there, some distant island, the desert, your ordinary everyday life experience will almost always disappoint you. But what happens instead if you bracket out your promised land, your fictional promised land in advance? What if you let go of your outcome from the outset? If you determine not to determine and instead just notice what you notice? What happens if before you reject the desert, the wilderness, you take it on its own terms and you say, well, what is here? What sorts of flowers bloom in the desert? What sorts of critters crawl there? What sort of joy does that open expanse of sky afford? Chris Tomlin is the St. John's Bible illuminator who created the naturalist depictions of insects. Insects, all indigenous, uh, by the way, either to Minnesota or Wales, the, the two homesteads um, of those who collaborated on the project. Tomlin's illustrations prompt us to notice the ordinary and to pause and wonder as much at the dandelion as at the rose or the rose window. His butterflies are magnificent, and yet he doesn't just include butterflies, but also moths uh, and, and dragonflies. Um, so, Nathaniel, if you would do the next three slides and just uh, pause yet yeah, each one. Here's a look at translucent wings. Um, this next guy looks like he's got night vision goggles on. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Then the correction bee comes next with another butterfly pasted next. And then if you just hold it there, Nathaniel, thanks. So uh, here's the monarch butterfly 
And the life cycle of the butterfly here, right, with uh, caterpillar cocoon and butterfly, often, uh, I mean, is, is obvious uh, representation of resurrection and rebirth. But it also indicates this kind of slowing down in the, in the process of spiritual formation because we cannot rush a wildflower or a butterfly any more than we can rush a child growing up. Go out to Falling Waters Trail this spring and, and just watch the butterflies. They, they don't seem to have a utilitarian agenda in their flight pattern. They're more like a kite dancing in the wind. Um, they, they're, they're, their pattern darts around like it, it's some sort of exotic dance. And the same is true of spiritual formation. Thomas Merton once told a friend to stop trying so hard in prayer. Merton said, how does an apple ripen? It just sits in the sun. And what he's saying here is that we unfold in God's time like ripening apples. Let me um, put up two more slides. Um, next slide, please, Nathaniel. So just hold it at that one. And I'd like us, for, uh, us to ponder uh, this one for a moment. This comes from the book of Judges. The entire illumination is on the left. Uh, though down below at the bottom, there's a quote from Judges, all the people did what was right in their own eyes. And so just like notice what you notice in this illumination, enlarged piece of it on the right. There's a certain beauty to it. And yet, there's no real center, is there? There's a lot of chaos going on there. No real stability. And I don't know if you can see, um, there are some golden calves thrown in there. There's a lot of violence too. Animals eating people. And the gold bars you can see, especially you can see them a little bit better on the one on the right. The gold bars represent the divine presence and the black bars almost overpowering the gold bars represent human sin. Commenting on the gold wedges that illustrate God's continuing presence with the people in spite of their frantic waywardness, illuminator Donald Jackson suggests the wedges are, quote, sort of scurrying around, almost like divine sheepdogs, trying to pull all these people together while they're all defying it going their own way, and still surrounded by the symbols of their yearning for foreign gods. I think you should have thrown some cell phones in here too. It's just a really a great image of our frenetic modern mindset, I think, depicting what we experience. Okay, um, next slide. Let me finish with one more slide for reflection and ask you what you notice. This is Jacob's ladder from Genesis chapter 28. Jacob dreams, and he sees angels ascending and descending on a ladder between earth and heaven. Look at the angels. They're so free. Spiritual formation always intends to set us free in Christ. Genesis says the angels are ascending and descending. And I like that order. Ascending comes first. Why? Because they're already here. They're here among us if we have eyes to see. Jacob says, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Is, meaning right now. In this place, meaning potentially any place. And though the latter connects heaven and earth here, the angels don't seem to need it, do they? This isn't some uh, 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 <laughs> separated two spheres, two stories, um, where heaven is up above and the earth is down below and every now and then God drops in. Rather, this is, is one connected spirit-infused realm. What about Chris Tomlin's butterfly wings? I don't know if you can see those throughout, interspersed throughout the illumination. Is the illuminator suggesting that the divine, the holy one, shines out from ordinary objects of beauty all around us? Chris Tomlin's butterflies in the St. John's Bible remind us that beauty is the ladder connecting 
heaven and earth. And his butterflies remind us that beauty appears to us unconjured, unbidden, certainly unrushed, alighting next to us any moment. Thank you. Go in peace. Uh, our next workshops are at 1115.